<laughs> All right. So, ladies and gentlemen, today we've got Bobby Casey. Bobby Casey is the person that comes to mind when I think of taxes, company structure, and basically anything within that realm. He's the man behind two businesses. We got Business Anywhere, which does on-demand company formations, registered agent services, virtual mailboxes, and more. You can do all of it from your computer. It's quick. It's easy. It's affordable. And if you don't really know what you're doing, they've got everything you need to help you out. And he's also the man behind Global Wealth Protection. They are a consulting firm that specializes in company structure and taxes around the world. So Business Anywhere will help you get your business started. Global Wealth Protection will help you protect your wealth once you've amassed it. Bobby, do you have anything to add about that? No, I mean, you pretty much nailed it. Business Anywhere is just our platform for entrepreneurs to uh, register the companies, do registered agent service. If they're, when you're registering your company, it's kind of a requirement to have registered agent service. Um, virtual mailbox, especially for people who are location independent or don't want to expose their home address and public record. We also do remote online notary um, and a few, other, few different things through Business Anywhere. We're actually adding uh, uh, tax filings. We just hired a CPA and an enrolled agent, so we're going to be doing tax filings uh, as well. And that's that's basically Business Anywhere. We're just kind of a, a, a business tools platform for entrepreneurs and investors who need those services. And then Global Wealth Protection is, like you said, we do tax consulting and uh, asset protection planning for uh, people who are really more interested in internationalization strategies, people who live in multiple countries who have assets in different countries. Uh, maybe they have uh, virtual or remote type businesses, that type of thing. And then I deal a lot with high net worth individuals for asset protection and estate planning. So okay. yeah, that's, that's pretty much it. Very cool. Well, I've been really excited to have you on my channel. Uh, most of our viewers are contractors, tradesmen, construction companies. Mm -hmm. And so most of them, you know, they, they want to get an LLC. They don't know where to start. They don't like even me, I've, I've started multiple LLCs with your companies and I still don't, I'm still not an expert. I still don't know everything. And that's why I like to, just defer to you guys to help me when it comes to that. But today I'd like to go through and just talk about company structures for contractors, what they need to know, maybe compare things like sole proprietorships, limited liability companies or LLCs, and just discuss like, why would you need these things? What are the pros and cons? And just explore this topic to help educate our viewers. Sure. Let's dig in. This is my my everyday conversations, I do I do client consultations um, normally three days a week, occasionally four days a week, and this is what I talk about all day, every day, every week. Awesome. Well, there's definitely going to be some people watching who want to skip all this and just get a hold of you, so let's talk about that real quick. If somebody wants to enlist your help getting their company structured properly, how can they reach you? Uh, just for company structure, it's really easy. You just go to businessanywhere.io, and uh, if you're looking to register a company just across the top there, you'll see uh, business registration. You click that, super easy. You just click the uh, Get Started button, and you just go through steps. It usually takes five or ten minutes to go through the, the process, and that's it. You can see the different uh, options for company structure on the page, and then also you see the different options once you're going through the our registration process on the site, but it's ridiculously easy. We built it exactly for uh, people to like really simplify the process. Um, and that's that's for business anywhere. If you're trying to reach out for uh, tax consulting or asset protection planning, that sort of thing, then uh, you'd find us at globalwealthprotection.com. Okay, awesome. All right, so let's just go to the very beginning of a uh a business's life cycle. If somebody just starts doing business today, doesn't do any kind of company structure, they're automatically considered a sole proprietor, correct? Correct. Yeah. I mean, that's just literally, you know, if you're a contractor and, you know, a handyman, for example, and you post an ad on Facebook marketplace or 
Craigslist or, you know, whatever the different platforms are. And you just post an ad and people say, hey, come and fix my stuff. <laughs> then you're just showing up and they're writing you a check or handing you cash. They're paying you. So if they're paying Chuck, they write a check to Chuck and that's it. That's what's considered sole proprietorship. You're not operating through a business structure. You don't have any legal protections. You don't have a separate legal identity. Um, people pay directly to your personal bank account. Uh, everything uh, goes through your personal social security number for tax reporting and everything. You don't have a separate legal identity. So, and that's that would be the way you would start if that's what you were doing. That would be, that would be very, very, very basic low level. That would be, in, in my opinion, the only reason you would ever uh, operate really as a sole proprietor. And I mean ever, I'm talking from day one. The only reason you would ever do that is if this was really a low risk, um, very small scale side hustle. Like, you know, for example, I've over the, you know, when I was living, you know, predominantly in North Carolina, you know, I would buy and sell things online sometimes. Like I would buy a motorcycle and resell it or buy a car and resell it. In that case, yeah, I'm not registering a company for that because it's a really small, low level side hustle. Mostly I'm getting paid in cash, that sort of thing. But if you're going to make a real business out of it, uh, sole proprietors, sole proprietorships never really a great option. Okay. And so what most construction companies will do is form an LLC. So mm -hmm. can you talk about what that means, what's the difference between the sole proprietorship and the LLC, and maybe at what point should a contractor who's currently a sole proprietor consider forming the LLC? I'll answer that in reverse. At what point should a contractor who's currently operating as a sole prop convert to LLC? The answer is yesterday. Like, you should, you should never have operated as a sole proprietor in the first place, especially if you're a contractor, there are so many risks with what you're doing. Like you could end up damaging somebody's house tremendously. You could get hurt. You could hurt somebody. You could have your helper get hurt. And if you're operating as a sole proprietor, you are personally taking on all of that liability. I mean, let's say you're a plumbing, or, and even that one really is a roofing contractor. Let's say you're a roofing contractor and you're putting a new roof on somebody's house and um, you're kind of mid process and, you know, you haven't laid the rest of the shingles or tiles or whatever you're doing and somebody falls or the roof collapses, whether maybe the, maybe the homeowner got up on the ladder and said, Hey, I'm going to go check it out and see what's going on. Or maybe you've got an employee that falls off the roof and gets killed. If you're operating as a sole proprietorship, crazy, like you are taking on personal liability for what can be a huge, huge risk there. So the answer to the question, when should you do it? The answer is you should never have done it in the first place. So you should automatically have an LLC. And if you haven't done yet, you should do it yesterday. Um, and so the differences between a sole proprietor and LLC I alluded to is basically as a sole proprietor, you have a hundred percent of the responsibility of any action of your business. So if that person falls off the roof and gets killed. You are personally liable for that death which means that person that died, their family is going to sue you for an enormous sum of money. Um, and I use this as an example because I actually grew up in a construction family and this was a real situation in my dad's company when I was pretty young. I was like small, single digit age kid. But I remember the story later when I was a teenager, dad explaining it to me. And basically they had a subcontractor who was you know, the roofing subcontractor and what had happened is that subcontractor did not have, they were operating as a sole proprietor and they did not have a uh, worker's comp. And so in the state of North Carolina, I think it was Virginia, actually, in the state of Virginia, um, you were not required to have worker's comp unless you had two or, or more than two employees in addition to yourself as the owner. And so this roofing contractor chose to forego the expense of workers comp, didn't have the insurance, guy fell off the roof, gets killed. Well, the problem was the guy had a newborn baby and the wife was a stay at home mom. And basically 
the subcontractor vanished when they got sued. So they sued my dad's company, which was the GC. And that was it. they ended up getting sued for millions. And they ended up actually having to pay uh, a, a salary with cost of living increases for 18 years until that kid turned 18 years old. And they had to fund a college fund for that, that kid. Um, I mean, wow. it was a ton of money. Now, insurance for the for my dad's company, the GC covered part of it, but not all of it. They didn't have the the amount of coverage to cover all of that. And if you're a contractor, that is a very real risk. Like it's not even anecdotal. Like my dad literally lived through it. I you know I didn't exactly live through it. I was a kid, but my dad lived through it, and it was a very real situation. And so, I mean, it's a very real risk if you if you have a major issue and you're operating as a sole prop, you can you can pretty much guarantee you're going to lose everything because um, they're going to sue you and they're going to win and they're going to take it. They're going to take your house, your cars, your bank accounts, literally everything. So you never want to operate as a sole prop because comparatively, if, if that was in an LLC, they can't come after you personally. They can only sue the business. Now, you may lose the business. You may lose the assets of the business, but your personal assets are not at risk at that point. Like nobody can come after your house, your cars. Maybe you have some other investments outside of your business. Maybe, you know, they're structured in a different way, um, but they can't come after anything personal if the activity happened from the business. That's what we call an inside creditor liability. So it's a liability that arises from the activity of the business itself. And with a sole prop, you're fully exposed to everything. With an LLC, you're limited. I mean, that's what it means, limited liability. You're limited to... Uh, the activity that happened within the operation of that 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 business itself. So I mm-hmm. mean, and really, like if if you are operating as a sole prop and you have any reasonable amount of business, I mean, literally, it could be you could just be uh, uh, a, a one man shop, or you know, maybe you got a helper and you do HVAC work or something. You're probably still bringing in a reasonable income, and I mean, you're talking a few hundred bucks a year to maintain an LLC. This is the cheapest insurance you could possibly have. I mean, it's way cheaper than having um, high coverages on, on you know, liability to cover everything. I mean, it's gonna be, I mean, you want that also, don't get me wrong, you want the liability coverage also, but mm-hmm. instead of paying for liability coverage for up to 10 million, for example, maybe you only have like a umbrella policy that covers a million and then you're running your business through an LLC to protect your personal assets. So, okay. Yeah, I, I so, would not operate as a sole prop. So a sole proprietor is just fully responsible for everything, no matter what. The limited liability company limits your liability in case something goes wrong. Now I, sure. yeah. I, now I, mean, I don't works, know. If, but by the way, like just think about it. You, you can have one employee driving your company truck. Maybe he's not even working, but he's driving your company truck and gets in a car crash. They're going to sue your company. But if you're a sole prop, that company is you. Um, and you're going to be fully exposed there, even if he just like has a car accident <laughs> driving around in his off hours because he happens to have the keys to your company truck. Sure. Right? I mean, yeah, so you gotta be, it's crazy to operate as a sole prop. There's, there is no good reason to do that. So there, there is limitations to that, right? Because I used to think that an LLC basically made you not liable for anything. But somewhere along the lines, I heard or read that you're covered if someone like one of your employees makes a mistake or the homeowner gets hurt. But if you personally make a mistake, they can still sue you personally, correct? Yeah. And that that would be if they find you negligent, like you personally, they find you personally negligent. Because in that case, like, for example, let's say, I don't know, you uh. I mean, you come to work drunk, right? And let's say you come to work drunk. That's a great example of negligence. And let's say you're a contractor who does tree work. You're an arborist and you do tree work and you come to work drunk one day, cut a tree down and drop the tree on somebody's house. Um, Yeah, I mean, you're going to have personal liability there because of negligence. You Mm -hmm. showed up for work drunk. You have personal liability there. So they're going to sue the business. Absolutely, they're going to sue the business, and they're going to name you also in that lawsuit because of that negligence. Now, if you weren't drunk and there wasn't negligence and, like, who, who knows, you're cutting a tree down, you accidentally drop it. 
I mean, you weren't negligent. It was just a mistake and, you know, or the rope broke or something like that. You're trying to catch the rope or catch the chunk of the tree before it swung down. The rope breaks or the wind, it's gusty wind. The wind blows the tree the wrong way or something. They might try to sue you personally, but unless they can prove negligence that you actually did something wrong, then you wouldn't have any liability. They're going to go. They're just going to go out to the business. It doesn't stop them from suing you personally, but without proof of negligence, I mean, they're they're not going to get anywhere there. Okay. So as long as a, an owner of an LLC is operating in good faith, not coming to work drunk, not negligent, then the yeah. company structure will protect protect their personal assets from yeah, absolutely. accidents. Yeah. Okay. Very cool. Yeah. Um, I think that pretty much covers the basics. So we'll go into the operation and operational and legal aspects. So how does like what are the operational, like day to day implications of having an LLC? Are there things that you need to do in a certain way or um well, for example, bookkeeping. You want to keep your personal finances and your business finances separate. You want to have like a company debit card or a company credit card. You want to use um, that debit or credit card for only business expenses. You're filling up gas in your work truck. You're repairing your lawnmowers. You're buying new, you know, carpentry tools, whatever. Buy it through the business as a business expense. Don't co-mingle the funds between personal and business use. That's always, that's always a big, um, let's say, a gap that the court system can use and say, well, um, going back to you know, our previous conversation, can they hold the business owner liable? This could also be considered a negligent thing and that you are treating the business like your own personal bank account. So, you know, you go buy your kid's Christmas presents on the business credit card because you don't have any money in your personal bank account. All the money is in your business bank account. So you're like, yeah, I'll buy Christmas presents on the business card. I'll, I'll fix it in the bookkeeping later. Well, you never want to do that. You don't, because if you get sued for whatever in the business or personally or whatever, and they say, well, I mean, you're basically treating the business like your personal bank account. So we're going to treat it that way too. The court can say that we're going to treat the business like it's your personal bank account also. So you can't expose your business to some personal liabilities in that way as well. So you always want to keep your finances separate. Um, you know, business expenses with your business credit card, or if you're, you know, if you're like still living in the nineties, you can write checks, I guess, like, <laughs> but you know, I, it still amazes me when I see people pull a checkbook out. I'm like, really? Like who uses checks anymore? But I guess some people still do. Um, it still happens. But uh, or if you know cash transactions, if you're making cash transactions in the business, you need to keep very clear records. Like if you go to the ATM machine and you pull a thousand bucks out in cash from your like company ATM card, you need to keep records on what you spent that thousand dollars on, so that it's clear uh, that was a business expense because. If you say, I'm going to pull a thousand bucks cash out, but eh, you know, I'm going to use this to, for hotel, you know, a hotel on a weekend getaway or something like, you know, you're commingling, commingling assets again, or expenses and income and stuff there again. So you don't want to do that. So on day to day, you want to make sure you keep business income, business expenses separate from personal, and then just pay yourself, pay yourself, depending on the structure of your business, if you're. Um, if you're an LLC taxes and S corp, you want to pay yourself a regular salary and then you can pay, uh, like a bonus or a dividend. If you are a default structure LLC or default tax election for the LLC, you can just pay yourself like a monthly, uh, profit distribution. Um, but just make it clear. If you pay yourself whatever, 10 grand a month, pay 10 grand a month to your personal bank account and then use your personal account for personal expenses. Don't, just don't mix them. All right. So. Just to, to recap, the LLC will protect you as long as you're not negligent. So as long as you're not coming to work drunk or like doing things that are obviously pushing the risk over the edge. And then another way to be considered negligent is to not handle the finances properly and use business finances to directly fund your personal stuff. Correct. 
Yeah. Okay. I mean, there's there's a million different things negligent. You know, I mean, you you're a landscaper and you show up at a client's house and you get into an argument and get in a fist fight in the client's front yard. I mean, you know, that's that's negligent. <laughs> has, right? Has I this mean, happened before, Bobby? <laughs> not for me. I'm not a landscaper, but um, <laughs> like, but I mean, there's all kinds of things you can do that would be considered negligence, right? I mean, mm -hmm. you, you know, <laughs> I. You, you drive the, 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 let's say you have a truck with a trailer and you drive the truck and trailer and you like, like turn around, like sliding sideways through the, the, the customer's front yard. Like, <laughs> obviously that's you as a human being driving that vehicle, making a dumb choice, right? I mean, that's, I don't know. I'm just trying to be creative here on negligent things, but mm -hmm. you just got to think anything that would be, uh, if you had a, uh, a third person watching and a third person would say, hmm, that was not proper in the course of daily, normal daily operation of your business, and you really weren't doing that right. Like that could be considered I mean, something like that would be negligent, you know? Okay. I mean, I think anybody from the th like a third party looking in and saw you like come to do your roofing job and you showed up drunk. I think anybody looking at that would be like, okay, that's negligence. That's mm -hmm. obvious negligence, right? Or, you know, you get in a fist fight with your customer on the front porch. They probably consider that yeah. negligence. If you have like, to stop and obvious. ask, if you have to stop and ask, is this a bad idea? Then it, it probably is. is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> if, if, if you, if you have a, a tangle of thought in the back of your head going, should I do this? The answer is no, you shouldn't. <laughs> Absolutely no. Don't do that. Right? Yeah. Bob, just let Bobby's voice pop into your head and say, no, <laughs> don't do that. <laughs> yeah. All right. So I think we've firmly established that having an LLC is a must for contractors. And there's a couple of things they need to know. They need to know not to follow their bad ideas. They need to know not to be negligent. And they need to know that their books need to be kept properly in order to keep the company and the personal stuff separate. So mm -hmm. yep. let's quickly go through, like, what is the process in a nutshell for creating an LLC? And then what are the ongoing requirements to maintain it? Sure. So for creating an LLC, it, and so I know we're talking to contractors. So in this context for a contractor, you are almost always going to want to register the LLC in your home state. I mean, that's pretty much a given. Um, if if you had a different type of business, like a software company and all your employees work remote, that's a different scenario. We could think about that differently. But as a contractor, you have what's called a nexus in your state. Nexus is a physical connection to the jurisdiction where your, your business operates. So if you're a roofing contractor in Virginia, it doesn't make sense for you to register that company in Delaware or Wyoming or Nevada, because you actually work in Virginia. Your clients are in Virginia. Your employees are in Virginia. Your work trucks are in Virginia. Your equipment's in Virginia. You probably have a shop in, or an office in Virginia. Everything is connected to Virginia. So that's the first thing. Just register it in your home state. It's going to make your life easier um, in that scenario. Like I said, if you had a virtual business, we could discuss something different. But in your case, it's going to make your life easier to be registered in your home state. Um, Second, uh, a lot of people think I'll just go on the Secretary of State's website and I'm going to do it myself. And that's really just not a great idea, to be honest. Like, we, we do this for clients. Obviously, I'm a little biased because we do company formation for clients. But to be honest, it's such a low cost thing. I mean, you're talking a couple hundred dollars a year, which gives you peace of mind that it's done correctly and you are properly protecting your business and your assets and your privacy if you do it correctly through somebody that knows what they're doing, that has done hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands of these entity structures before, instead of you saying, you know what, I really want to save a hundred bucks and I'm going to do it myself on the Secretary of State's website. That is not a smart use of your funds. You want to save a hundred bucks somewhere, you know, skip Starbucks a couple of times. Like, 
Of course, nowadays, that's like not even skipping Starbucks that many times, right? Like $7 <laughs> a coffee, you're not skipping that many times. So skip Starbucks a few times to save 100 bucks a year, not, not skimp on how to properly structure your business. Because if you go do it yourself, we use Virginia as an example. If you're you know, a roofing contractor in Virginia and you say, I'm just going to go to the Virginia Secretary of State and do it myself. Yes, you can do it. It is possible for you to do it. But then you're going to come across questions through the application process that you may not understand the right way to answer. And you may not know the right um, way to do things. And so you default to what you think is the best, which may or may not be the best way. For example, you have to have a registered address in the state where you're registering the entity. Now, a lot of people say, well, I live in Virginia. I'll just use my home address. That'll be easy. The problem with that is you have now made your home address public record for anybody to see forever and ever. It's always in the Secretary of State's database. And that might not seem like a big issue for you now, but five years later, you have one of your employees fall off the roof and gets hurt and they want to sue you. I don't think you're going to enjoy process servers harassing your wife and kids at home um, because now they have your home address and they're going to be coming to your home and knocking on your door 100%. They're going to name you personally in the lawsuit because they have your name and they have your home address. They're going to do it. Now, like we discussed before, negligence. They may not find you negligent, but that doesn't mean they won't name you in a lawsuit and you have to defend it. You mm -hmm. might, you'll win most likely, but you're still going to have to deal with it. So using a service to help you register your company gives you somebody else's address to be your registered agent. So if you do it yourself, you're always going to use your address because you don't really know any better, your home or your office. If you use a company formation service like Business Anywhere, you're, you're going to use our address as your registered address. And then if you do get sued, the only address in public record for your business is our registered agent address and we receive mail on your behalf and we provide it to you. So if you do get served by a process server, they're not showing up at your door. They're not harassing your wife, your kids, your employees, that sort of thing. It's completely private. And your name, your personal name is not gonna be listed in public record. So that's another thing of how to do this correctly. Um, and then I think this will probably be a segue into a future conversation we're going to have, Chuck. But the other thing is to consider is do you want to have that LLC taxed as an S Corp? So that mm -hmm. means filing form 2553 to elect for S Corp tax election. So you may want to do that or you may not, depending on how you operate your business and your income level and that sort of thing. But there can be some tax advantages to having your LLC tax as an S Corp as well. Um, and then the short answer on, again, I'm biased, but the short answer on how to register the company. I mean, you go to our website and take about five minutes and fill in a few forms and that's it. Um, it's extremely straightforward. Okay. And then like, let's say that I file an LLC with you now, do I ever have to do anything again? So with the second, it depends on your state. So some states, well, yes, you always have to do something because you have to maintain a registered agent address in that state. And so if you do use us or somebody like us as your registered agent, in that case, you have to maintain that. You have to pay that fee every year um, to use our address for your business. And then in addition to that, most states have uh, a fee to file your annual report. And that varies depending on the state. Um, on the low end, well, some states don't have it, a few. Um, not many, but most states do. There's a few out there that have no annual report fee. Um, but the states that do have it, that ranges anywhere from $50 a year up to about $300 a year. So you have to pay the annual report fee. You have to pay for your uh, registered agent service every year. Um, and that's it with the, you know, to maintain the company. Now, with, with with us, we automate that whole process for you. Um, when you create your account, basically you have a credit card on file in your dashboard. And then let's say, uh, what's the day? Uh, November 20th or whatever the day is. So November 20th, for example, if you register a company with us on November 20th, uh, November 13th, 2024, next year, 
you're going to get a notification from us saying your company will be renewed in seven days. If you don't wish to renew it, please log in and press cancel. Um, if your card on file is no good, please update your card. Basically, we give you a notice that your company is going to get renewed. And then if you don't do anything, then on the 20th, your company is automatically renewed. Our system automates all of that. And so why that's important for you is a lot of times um, we're, we're actually the only uh, registered agent service out there that automates annual report filings and renewals. And what I've found over the years is what happened is a lot of people, maybe they traveling, they miss an email, the email goes in their junk box or it goes into the promotions tab in Gmail or something. Mm -hmm. And they don't see the invoice to renew the company. And then maybe a month later, finally, they realize they found the email or maybe we're calling you going, hey, your company's not renewed. And now you have late fees and penalties and interest due because you missed your deadline to renew the company. So we automate that process. So as long as your card on file is good, we automate it. You don't have to worry about having any late fees and it's always done for you. Um, okay. If you don't use us, if you did it yourself, then you're going to have to keep record of all the, uh, the timetable and the dates on that stuff. And you're going to have to log in, uh, pay your fee. You're going to have to file your annual report, fill in some forms, and then you have to renew your registered agent service as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I used to be a cheap ass and be like, I'm not going to pay anybody to do this. I'm going to do it myself. And I've filed annual reports a couple times. But now that you guys are handling everything, it's well worth the peace of mind of just knowing that it's done and done properly and that I don't have to do that. Because it would be like an email that I would scroll through and I'd see and I'd be like, oh, man, thank God I saw that email because that was a month yeah. ago and I have like three days to do this. So, yeah, I mean, it's it's not like it costs like three grand a year or something to do this. I mean, this is like, you know, a couple hundred dollars. It's not even that much money to make sure your business stays running and you don't have late fees and penalties and stuff like that. So it's pretty easy. So what if uh, what if the LLC is going to be owned by multiple people? Like, how does that work? Great, great question. So this is, you know, a multi-member LLC versus a single-member LLC. So if you have a multi-member LLC, then basically the only difference is when you draft the operating agreement for the LLC, you determine who the members are and what percentage membership interest they own. So if you had, let's say, four members and everyone owned 25%, then in the operating agreement, you have all four members' names listed. And then it shows that they each own 25% of that LLC, and that's it. I mean, it's pretty straightforward. And then from a tax standpoint, it's treated a little bit differently. So a single-member LLC, if you earn, I don't know, let's say $100,000 a year, you own an LLC by yourself, you're a single member, and you own 100% of it, at the end of the year, you do your bookkeeping and whatever, you're left with a net profit of 100000 then on your personal tax return, on your 1040 Schedule C, you're going to reflect $100,000 income from, you know, whatever, XYZ LLC. So it just goes on your personal tax return. If you have more than one member, so in the example I gave, you have four members, everyone owns 25%. It's treated a little bit differently. The LLC has to file a partnership tax return, Form 1065, and then part of 1065 is issuing K-1s out to each member. And so in this case, let's say the whole LLC made 100,000, each member owned 25%. Each member is gonna get a K-1 from that tax filing. It's gonna show that the company made 100,000 and their share of that profits, their partnership share of those profits is $25,000. And then they use that K-1, they add it onto their uh, part of their personal tax return. So it's kind of like getting a 1099 if you earn income there, but it's a K-1. It's more or less the same thing, except a K-1 is a partnership you own, whereas a 1099 is just a, like a fee or a commission or interest or whatever that you earn from something. Um, so there is a little, bit, a, a little bit more involved when you, if you have more than one member. It's not that complicated, but it's a little bit more to add the partnership tax return and the K-1s. Okay. This is a little off topic, but people usually have some opinions around partnerships. Do you have any particular opinions about partnerships? Um, 
you mean just in general like yeah just in general business partners yeah um i'm not a fan i'm not a fan um i have had a couple of partnerships in the past um uh, i had one partnership a long time ago and it was okay my work ethic was significantly more than my partner's work ethic and it wasn't a question like he it wasn't like we disagreed with each other he literally came to me and said can you buy me out i don't want to work as hard as you um and so it ended fine i bought him out and it was fine but you know during that period of time before i bought him out there's always a little bit of animosity like my god why am I working so much harder than this other guy? Like, is he not going to like carry his weight? And then I've had another business partnership that I ended as about three or maybe almost four years now. Um, I ended it. And we had a really bad, really bad break. It was a really good friend of mine. And we were 50, 50 business partners. And if you're going to do a business partnership, the worst possible way to do it is 50, 50. <laughs> that is, the dumbest way you can ever do a business partnership. If you're going to have a, a business partnership, you there somebody has to be the final decision maker. And even if it's 5149, it's better than 5050 because at least when you go into the partnership, you agree in advance, yes, I agree, you have final say. Or the other person, you know, you say yes, I agree, I have final say. So at least you have the determination at the beginning that you have decided somebody has final say um, because 100% of the time in a 50-50 business partnership, there will be times where somebody works harder than somebody else. Somebody is doing more. Somebody is bringing in more sales. Somebody is spending more time at the office. Um, and it's going to create some, maybe some jealousy, maybe some animosity between the two. And it's just, it's going to be tough. Um, so I, with that, I, I just don't, I think business partnerships are very difficult. Maybe they're just difficult for me because, you know, I don't like people and people don't like me. I don't know. <laughs> that mirrors the so, sentiment I've heard from many people and it makes perfect <laughs> sense, right? Like, it's a difficult thing to manage sometimes. Maybe we have like another uh, video. It'd be fun to have like a round table of just discussing partnerships and maybe some ideas on how to do it better. Yeah. I've, I've had a couple of others that were so-so. Um, the last one I had that ended about almost four years ago was terrible. I mean, I was really good friends with a guy and we haven't spoken since we split up. Like we yeah. were like not friends at all. Like yeah, that's too bad. That's too bad when that happens because you yeah. know, I try not to mix business and friends most of the time because of that reason. Um, yeah, it's, it's one thing like if you hire a friend like, mm, like outsourcing, you know, like if you outsource something to a friend and, and you have a f fixed fee or however the f payment structure is, but you have a fee, you pay them, they have a job. I mean, that's okay, but that's not a partnership, right? Like you're like literally hiring a friend because you trust them to do the job you want them to do. And I think there's no problem with that. Um, but like, I wouldn't want to take that same friend and say, Hey, you, you do such a great job. How about you come in as a partner in my business and I will give you a piece of equity and you can be like fully integrated into the business because, you know, I've done that before too. And in another relationship that I had to split it up, it, it didn't go badly. Like we, we just decided it didn't work anymore, but still it didn't work. Like it mm -hmm. didn't work out. I mean, we're still great friends. I mean, so it doesn't have to end badly, but there's always going to be a problem with business partners. Always. Somebody is always going to feel like they're doing more than the other one. A hundred percent. And it can be, it could change. Like maybe this month, I feel like I'm doing way more, and you're being a lazy ass. And then six months from now, you know, it's flipped. You think you're doing more and I'm being the lazy ass, right? So like it can it can ebb and flow like that. But mm -hmm. but that just means you're, you're gonna have conflict multiple times during the year now, right? Like you're, it's, it can be ongoing situations. So we have a couple more minutes. Uh, next sure. time, we'll do another one. We'll, we'll cover the 
advanced business structures like S Corp and whatnot, and then talk about all the tax stuff. But uh, yeah, since sure. we have a couple more minutes, do you want to? If you do, you have anything else to add about what we've talked about so far? Um, yeah, I, I just, I, I guess I'd, I'd like to reiterate: don't when when you're starting out in your new business, and I, a lot a lot of people say this: hey, you should totally. Just get your business going, figure it out, find your customer, make your product, get your service going, whatever. You can sort out the legal issues later. And to some extent, I do agree with that, but I also need to balance that with the other side is the problem is if your business starts doing well, you know, let's say you're a contractor with, um, you're doing HVAC service and you're like, you, you work for somebody for a while and you say, all right, I'm gonna start my own business. I'm gonna do this on my own. You split out, get a couple of customers. And then you're like, okay, I've got to you know, hire a helper apprentice now. And you get a couple more customers, and a couple more, and it starts growing. And you start out with the mindset, I'll deal with the legal issues later. I'll get the business structure properly later. I'll deal with the finances correctly later. Well, oftentimes that later, can be too late. Like you get to the point now where you have a pretty sizable business and you're still operating as a sole proprietor. And then you end up having an electrical issue at somebody's house and you burn down a third of their house and you're still operating as a sole prop. Because once you start operating in the business as an entrepreneur, as a business owner, what do you think about? You're, it's always, like most entrepreneurs were growth minded, next customer, next job, next, uh, you know, next offer, next employee, you know, we're thinking future, 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 growth, 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 right? We don't think about how do we like fix, you know, our structure? How do we get the organization right? How do we get our finances right? Our booking, bookkeeping right? How do we do all these things? And this is what most people do. The problem is I've seen it way too often where people they just don't deal with it because they're always focused on the growth and it's always like, eh, I'll do it later. I'll do it later. So you got to balance it like, okay, fine. Get your first customer or two started. And once you've got a little bit of money in your bank account, get the company structure done because the longer you wait, the harder that's going to be, the more complicated it's going to be, the more customers you're going to have to give new information to, you know, now they're paying Tom Smith HVAC guy, and all of a sudden now they got to pay, you know, HVAC Industries LLC or whatever. Um, you know, it, it, you have more and more, it, it becomes a bigger and bigger headache to make the switch. And then, mm -hmm. then it becomes you kind of spiral. You're like, oh, such a big headache to change all my stuff to the, over to the business. Ah, forget it. I'll do it next month. I got too much going on. I got too many customers this week. I'll do it next month. So don't get too hung up on doing it later. Like maybe a little bit later, but don't, don't drag it out because you're going to get yourself in trouble like that. Almost inevitably, you're going to get yourself in trouble like that. Okay. Either, either you're going to get sued or you're going to have a tax issue or you're going to have a money issue or something like that. But sort it so. out as early as you can. Sort it out early and let's finish off with the last question. Uh, yeah, sure. Let's, let's say somebody, they take action, they listen to your advice and they start their LLC. What do they need in order to go get a bank account for that company? So when you register the LLC, you're going to have uh, an articles of, articles of incorporation that you get, you know, when you do the filing with Secretary of State, it's a automatic thing. And then uh, we would also draft your operating agreement, which shows that you own the business um, and you're the manager of the business. And then it could be possible that you need a bank resolution letter. Sometimes the banks ask for it. Sometimes they don't. Um, it just depends on the bank. So those are three things. You, well, two that you definitely need. You always need the articles of organization. You always need the operating agreement. The third one is Maybe you need it, maybe you don't, depending on the bank. Um, and then you're going to need some ID document for you because they're going to have to do what the bank calls KYC or know your customer uh, verification on you as the business owner and as the signer on the account. So you're going to have to have some ID verification on you, like uh, your passport, driver's license, passport card, 
you know, government issued ID, and then they're going to need to know the business address. Um, so if we register it for you, you want to use the, the registered agent address for the business. And then they're probably also going to want to know as part of the KYC, uh, they're going to do on you as a signer on the account, they're going to want your address. Um, and that would be whatever you use as your personal address. And so if, you know, that could be your home address. If you're like me and you're really adamant about privacy, I use a virtual mailbox for everything because I don't ever expose my home address in public records anywhere mm -hmm. ever. Um, but if you're not so adamant about privacy like me, then you'd probably just use your home address uh, as part of your KYC verification. So if you if you do use your you. if you use your home address, is there a way to get it out of public record? Well, um, well, that, that's not public record. That's KYC verification with the bank. Mm -hmm. I just don't like to give anyone my home address anywhere. I don't like for me, I have several bank accounts in the US for businesses and personal. None of them have the address where I go to sleep at night. None of them. Mm -hmm. they, and if you were to pull up a credit report on me or a background check on me, you could never find it. It's never anywhere because I only use virtual mailbox addresses for uh, all, all of my personal addresses. Um, so in, in my case, I've never put my home address in public record, so it's nowhere to be found. Um, but if you have your, your personal address in public record, like let's say you registered an LLC and you didn't know what you're doing, you did it yourself, and you created that LLC and used your home address as the registered agent address, uh, yeah, there's no way to, the, the only way to do that is to dissolve that LLC and start a new one, basically. Okay. Uh, because once it's in public record for that LLC, it never goes away. It's always in the historical record. So um, if, even if you're not a, worried about privacy right now, if you think you ever might be, it's a good idea to just do that now. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And a lot, a lot of people are like, ah, why do I care about privacy? And all of a sudden, five years later, they realize the reason that why they should have cared about privacy the whole time, but they didn't know it at the time. And that's, mm -hmm. you know, that's why they call them unforeseen circumstances, right? Because <laughs> they're unforeseen. Exactly. You end up having a situation where, you know, somebody gets your home address and, and stalks you or something like that, or stalks one of your family members or stealing packages, you know, stealing all your Amazon packages or something like that. <laughs> Awesome. I mean, these are silly things, but they're real, like real things. I've, I've seen all the YouTube videos of Amazon packages getting ripped off. They are pretty funny, especially when the people fight back and <laughs> like, like put uh, glitter bombs and stuff like that uh -huh. into fake Amazon packages. Yeah, yep. those are pretty entertaining. I've seen some of those. All right, Bobby, we're out of time. Next time, we're going to cover uh, like S corps and and taxes and things like that. Um, Perfect. Thank you for tuning in, everyone. Again, this is Bobby Casey. Businessanywhere.io is the place you can go to get your LLC registered. And then if you have a lot of money you're trying to protect, Global Wealth Protection is where you should go. Very good. Thanks, Chuck. All thanks right. for having me. Yep. Thanks for being on.